Hi, I'm Alistair. I'm a games designer and it's now late October, nearly Halloween night. So in this video, I thought I'd demonstrate something a little bit spooky. Now, you're probably familiar with one of these. This is a Ouija board or a talking board and it is designed for communicating with spirits. So the idea is you have a pointing device like this. This is called a planchette. And you see it's got a large circular window in the middle of it. So you place that on the board. And then the idea is that spirits will guide the planchette around and spell messages by revealing letters or numbers through that window in the middle of the planchette. So to demonstrate this, I guess the first thing I need to do is to say if there are any spirits present and listening to invite them to come and let themselves be known to um, tell us who they are. Okay, the planchette starts moving to an A, then an R, a D, U, I, N, and then an O. Okay, so if you've seen any of my other videos on this channel, you'll be unsurprised to hear I appear to be haunted by the ghost of an Arduino. But if you were using this in an escape room, you could spell any message you wanted or give a four digit code, for example. And there's other things you can do with this technology as well. Shall we show the people watching what else we can do? Yes. Okay, let's lose the Ouija board for a moment. And instead, let's set up a nice game of chess. Uh, now, this is a very old chess board. It's actually being kind of held together by tape in the middle of it. So I'm just going to try and secure it on there a bit. Uh, OK, so uh, you can be white. I'll be black. I'll just put some pieces on the board. OK, white goes first. Oh, well, you could have waited for me to start. OK, oh, whoa, well, all right, steady. No holds barred. What the? No, oi, stop it. Right, at least you Whoa, and at least my queen's all right. No! Ah, oh, seriously. <sighs> In this video, I'm going to tell you more about how you can create fun interactions like these. So, as we just discovered, in this case at least, this apparently supernatural movement is not being controlled by spirits. Rather, it can be explained by an Arduino mechanism combined with some clever use of magnets. Now, I think probably the easiest way for me to demonstrate what's going on is for me to replay that opening sequence but showing you what I can see from my side of the board. Okay so if we take a look underneath here what you'll see is I've got an aluminium frame that has a carriage that can move in both the x and y axes controlled by these two stepper motors. And on the head of the carriage I've got two magnets here and they line up with two magnets on the planchette. So that means that I can move it around the board, but also keep it facing the same direction. Uh, now these two stepper motors, the controls for those are over here. So I've got a 12 volt power supply at the top for the motors, a CNC shield, an Arduino, a power supply for the Arduino, and also this joystick. Now this is going to let me input manual commands to move those stepper motors, but I could also trigger an automated pattern. So and that's what happens to spell out the word at the beginning. Now, the point I'm reading stepper motors is because they allow very precise inputs. Uh, so within a, a fraction of a millimetre, I can get them to move exactly the same pattern and repeat the same sequence of movements over and over again. Now, if you've ever used a laser cutter or a laser engraver machine before, this kind of hardware might seem pretty familiar to you. Um, this is actually my laser engraver, which I'm using to create the Ouija board, which I showed in the sequence at the beginning. And that's being controlled by some PC software here. So you can see I've got a vector image on the right, and the software is translating that image into a series of movements um, with coordinate values of X and Y. That's what's tracing the different paths in the image. It's sending that over a USB serial connection to the laser controller, which itself is an Arduino, and that's making the laser head move on those X and Y axes to trace the picture. 
So because the functionality we want in this project is so similar to the behaviour you'd get from a laser engraver, we can actually save ourselves a lot of time by reusing existing hardware and software that have been developed to run these kind of machines. So to start with in terms of the hardware, you can build a frame like this yourself. Um, the bars here are made from extruded aluminium and this is called uh, 2040, which means it's 20 millimeters across and 40 millimeters down. And that's a fairly standard uh, sort of measurement that you can get. And you can cut these to any length you want to fit underneath a table, for example. You've then got some uh, NEMA 17 stepper motors that are running on these timing belts here. These are little uh, kind of rows of teeth which you can roll out and then a cog on the stepper motor will pull the gantry up and down this y-axis and then another one here will move it along the x-axis. Uh, the stepper motors themselves are typically powered by some stepper motor drivers. These are Palulu A4988 clips normally and they're controlled by an Arduino. So you can build an entirely custom one of these yourselves but I have to be totally honest it is easier and cheaper to buy a uh, a ready-made sort of DIY engraver kit and I'll include a link uh, below that has all of these parts all ready to go and all you simply need to do is screw it together it takes about an hour to assemble. You can buy one that doesn't have the laser head on it which means you can just attach your magnets or alternatively you can get one that does have a laser head and then you can also use it as a laser engraver so um, that's a bonus. Then in terms of the software side of things, the way that you would normally use one of these machines is to have a PC here which is running some uh, Gerbil software. That sends those commands over this USB serial link to the Arduino and the Arduino translates them into the motions required by the stepper motors and also tells it to turn the laser on or off at a certain power. Now we don't need to have a laser in R1, you could if you wanted though have uh, an electromagnet let's say that you turned on or off. I was using permanent magnets in this example but if you wanted to extend the project that's one way of doing it. Um, but what we want to do is not just have uh, a vector image which has been sent into a series of commands the Arduino, we want to have possibly a free form manual way of controlling these stepper motors. So I'm going to modify this diagram slightly. So I'm going to take out this cable that is going to the Arduino at the top and instead we're going to pass that signal into a, a kind of a in the middle Arduino here. So this is the Arduino that is controlling the uh, CNC motors itself and this is running some Gerbil software which I'll give you the link to. You can download that from GitHub. This Arduino here is receiving the signals from the PC and forwarding them on through a software serial interface to the controller here and it's also passing the signals back that come from the controller back to the PC. So as far as the PC software is concerned this is a completely transparent pass through. Um, it thinks that it's connected directly to the machine and, and vice versa but it also means that we can inject real-time information into that stream of commands. So to do that, that's why I've got this joystick wired in here. Um, so with the joystick we can actually uh, create jog commands which move the heads left or right or up or down. Or We can press a button that triggers a predetermined pattern or something like that. And we can still send commands from the PC if we want to or if you'd rather not we can simply remove this completely now and just use this Arduino as our controller interface to the machine. So here's the code that I've written to run on that Arduino and just to be clear this is the Arduino Uno in that wiring diagram so this is the one that is going to sit between the PC and the CNC controller and it's going to allow data to be passed seamlessly through it between those two devices but it will also allow us to inject new commands to control the CNC controller to move the head on the carriage uh, either through a pre-programmed pattern or manually through a joystick input or something like that. 
So, um, as with all my projects, uh, I tend to follow a fairly consistent pattern. So I always start with the include section at the top. And this is for any external libraries which I'm going to make use of um, in this code. And I'm only using one, it's called Altsoft Serial. I've used this before in some of my other projects as well. So, as I described, what we're going to do here is have one serial connection from this device going to our PC, that's going to receive an input of any command sent from the PC software. But then we're also going to have a serial output that is going to go to the uh, CNC controller. And we're going to pass information between those two. Now, an Arduino Uno or a Nano only has one serial interface though and that's the one that's normally uh, attached to the USB connector that's what allows you to use the serial monitor and that's what allows you to upload new code onto the board and things like that so in order to allow this to act as a pass-through we need a second serial port and that's what Altsoft Serial will let us do it will assign a pair of pins of GPIO pins that we can use as a transmit and receive pin for a second serial connection. Now you might have uh, used the soft serial library in the past as well. Uh, that's one that comes with the Arduino IDE and does a very similar function. Uh, it's just the alt soft serial library which you can uh, download for free is uh, slightly more robust and it is faster so it's going to allow us to keep that flow of information going with, with less risk of um, losing any instructions or packets of data. Um, okay, then we get onto the constant section. So the constants will be uh, variables that won't change during the duration of the project. And we've got three related constants at the top here. And these all relate to what we call the jog control. So normally a, a CNC or a laser machine, normally it executes a a sequence of uh, actions one after another so you've got a, a long job that describes you know tracing the outline of a shape and that will be broken up into a whole series of movements in the XY um, dimensions but uh, a jog control is a little bit like a kind of a manual override so it's when uh, an operator of the machine uses a joystick or maybe keyboard controls cursor keys something like that to manually jog the head slightly from the sequence that have been pre-programmed. And that's what we're going to use with the, the joystick in this code. So these three uh, values here describe how that jogging motion is going to work. This one here, this is uh, the distance which the head is going to move each time it receives a jog command. And we're going to use the same distance in the X and Y axis. Uh, this is going to be the speed at which we're going to tell the motors to move that distance. And this value here is going to be if we hold the joystick down in a uh, direction, so if we hold the right direction, for example, how often are we going to uh, send another command to make it move in uh, that distance, in that speed? So these three are all kind of related. What we want is we want to have this value quite small because that will give us a fine resolution to enable us to jog the controller a very precise amount in a particular direction. We want uh, this value to be relatively high because that will make it seem more responsive. So when we hold the joystick down, we'll be sending a lot of very small commands. And we'll want this one to be large enough to ensure that um, you can actually cover the distance that you want to, to travel. So this will depend on your particular setup. Um, and I'll be totally honest that I set these values purely from trial and error and you will probably find you need to tweak them too to your particular setup. But one thing you don't want to do is to, let's say we set this value very low and this value very high, what you'd be doing is you'd be very frequently sending commands to move a large distance and what happens uh, with Gerbil which is the um, system that is running on the Arduino Nano that's controlling the thing it actually queues up commands in advance 
So if you send a lot of messages too quickly, it will have this buffer and you'll end up with kind of a lag telling it to slow down or at the worst extreme, you might actually exceed the buffer as there. So these are a matter of kind of tuning these to get the responsiveness you want to make it uh, react quickly to inputs, to get it to be precise enough, but also cover a great enough distance and also not to fill the buffer up. So there, these are just values you'll need to tweak. There is no magic formula to, to set these correctly, but I recommend you start with these and see what happens. We've then got some uh, pin definitions we're going to use for our inputs. So I've got an analog joystick, so I'm going to use analog pins to record the amount it's held in the X and Y axes. Uh, and it's also got a button on the top. Now, this is just a digital button, so it doesn't need to use an analog pin here. Uh, but I'm using one just for convenience. Every analog input on an Arduino can also act as a digital input, not the other way around there. Um, so these two are analog inputs. This is actually a digital input, but I'm using one of the pins, which is labeled A0. And we're going to use that for our jog control in the XY. And I'm going to use the button here to uh, execute a pre-programmed pattern of movements. Okay, so then we get onto our globals. So these are variables which are shared uh, amongst the whole code here. So having included that Altsoft serial library, we actually need to create an instance of that software serial connection. So we just call the constructor here. Now, if this were the software serial library or the soft serial library, we'd normally have to define the pins we want to use for receiving and transmitting. But the, uh, the Altsoft serial library, uh, the trade-off of it being more robust and uh, faster is that you don't get to choose those pins. So on an Arduino Uno or Nano, these always are going to be pin eight for receiving serial connections and pin nine for transmitting them. So you don't need to specify any parameters here in the constructor uh, because that is limited anyway. We'll then keep track of a uh, few global Boolean values. So is jogging, this is going to tell us, are we currently holding the joystick in a particular direction to jog the head? And is the button currently being pressed? So we use those to, to just let us know what our current inputs is. And we'll also keep track of the last time a command was sent to the controller. Uh, we'll use that in conjunction with the delay here just to make sure that we don't spam the controller with too many messages per second. So that's what that does. Okay, then we get into the setup function. So this is what executes when the code first starts up. And first of all, we will create that serial connection. So this is using the hardware serial interface, which is going to the PC via the USB connection. And we'll create that at a relatively fast board rate. We will then create the software serial interface. So this is using alt serial, not software serial, uh, not serial, alt serial. And we'll begin that at 9,600. Now notice this is a slower board rate, this will have to match whatever the uh, board rate is expected from your CNC controller. And you will have to look in the documentation for this. It's typically either 9600 or 115200. If um, you can't find out, it is actually possible to change those settings anyway and just re-upload a new version of Gerbil to your CNC controller and then choose whatever the board rate you have here. So long as they match, basically, is the most important thing. And because we're only using a software uh, emulated serial connection here, we don't want this to be too fast. If you were trying to uh, create a software emulated serial connection at this speed, you'd probably find that you wouldn't be able to keep up with it because the Arduino has only got a, a little processor and it's trying to do lots of other stuff as well. So if it was also trying to emulate a serial connection at this speed, uh, you'll probably find it will struggle. But we can create a hardware serial interface at that speed because it's got a dedicated chip to do that. So that's why the two speeds are different. This one is an emulated serial connection. This is a dedicated hardware connection. We'll uh, initialize our joystick button as an input pull-up um, because that's going to enable us to detect when the button has been pressed or not. 
and we will do our first command that we're going to issue to the CNC controller. So um, I want to demonstrate sort of how to do that. So normally you're probably familiar with serial.print or serial.println as a way of sending uh, information and text back to the Arduino IDE. That's how you can print stuff to be displayed in the serial monitor and things like that. Well, now we've got these two serial connections, remember. We've got this one, which is going to the PC. And we've got this one that is going to the CNC controller. And so when we want to send information to the controller, instead of printing to this one, we simply print to the alt serial instead. So the question mark is a command that we're going to send to the controller and that tells it to print its current status. And it will respond with a text string that looks something like this. Uh, so this tells us uh, its current state. So is it moving? Is it idle? Is it in an alert state or something? This will give us the coordinate values in the X, Y, and if you have one, uh, Z dimensions as well. So we can use this to actually keep a real time uh, tracking of the movement of the head and also the status of the uh, board itself, whether it's ready to receive new instructions and things like that. And it's really simple to issue commands to the controller. We simply print to the alt serial connection. Uh, we'll display the results of that a bit later on. I'll show you how we do that. But when we first start up, we're just going to issue that command and then we move on to the program loop, which is the main body of the code. So in every iteration through the loop, what we do is we keep track of what the current time is. And we're going to use that in a moment. And then we've basically got three alternative ways that we're going to direct the uh, CNC to do something. And we'll look at each of them in turn. The first one is we're going to tell it to play back a sequence of instructions to move the head. And this is exactly what I did when I spelt out that uh, word Arduino in the video. So we tell whether the joystick button has been pressed or not. So we do a digital read on the joystick button. That exclamation mark there is because we're using a pull up uh, pin. So we want to test whether the digital read reads low. That lets us know that the, the button's been pressed. We then uh, compare it to whether the button is pressed variable. Now, this is to make sure that we don't accidentally trigger the pattern twice in two successive loops. What we want to know is that the button is pressed now, but it wasn't being pressed before. So basically, we've just pressed the button. That's what the combination of these two does. So that's a, a kind of a, a primitive debounce operation. So if that's true, and if we've just pressed the joystick button, then we're going to send these series of commands to the alt serial interface. So this is what's going to go to the CNC controller. Now, uh, I'll show you a, a link where you can look up all of the Gerbil commands, but they're actually pretty straightforward. So I will just show you um, the, the basic ones we have here. The first thing is we're going to set a modal value that tells it what sort of coordinates we're going to use. So G90 means that all of these subsequent commands are going to use absolute coordinate values. So this is where um, X0, Y0 would be at one corner of the um, working area. It will actually be defined by the position the head is in when the, uh, when the controller is turned on. But assuming that you have positioned that at the bottom left, which is how most people do it, all of the subsequent X and Y values here are going to be relative to that origin there. So this is a absolute relative to an origin. So that's what G90 means. And then we're just going to send these series of commands. And each of these is a G01. So this means move the head, basically. This is a simple linear movement to this X coordinate this y coordinate at this rate so you could you know you could plot this on graph paper what this is going to draw out basically and in fact that is exactly how um you know i designed some of these movements we've got a series so you go to x21 y7 then you go to x21 y20 
Then you go to x16, y16, etc, etc, etc. And it will add these to the planner on the Gerbil and it will execute them. Uh, we will update the button is pressed variable to let it know that true. That means that on the next loop through, this will not allow us to um, execute that same series of, of movements again until we've released it and we press it again. So um, if it's currently being pressed down and if it wasn't pressed down before, execute these actions. If it's not currently being pressed down, then we fall into this bit and we'll update the button is pressed value to be false. Okay, so this is how we're going to uh, execute one of those pre-programmed patterns of movements. That's option one. Option two, well this is where we have the manual override input, that jog control which I was talking about at the top. So if we want to do that kind of movement, well the first thing we need to do then is to read our input values. So I'm going to take an analog reading of the X and the Y pins and I'm just going to call them raw X and raw Y at the moment. Now I'm using a, a sort of a cheap Arduino joystick which is very easy to get on the internet and the way that um, that is read on my Arduino I get a value between 0 and 1023 on my analog input and when I'm not touching the joystick at all I get a, a value of around 512 that's obviously halfway in between so the next thing I want to do is I want to convert that into a range between minus one and one instead with zero in the middle because I don't want my head to constantly be moving 512 to the right and 512 up when I'm not pressing the joystick. So we're going to use the map function. Now what map does, this is built into the Arduino IDE and it lets you basically remap a value from one range to another range. So we're going to take the x that we received, this raw x value here, we're going to take that it used to be in the range from 0 to 1024. I'm going to change it to be in the range from minus 100 to 101. That's actually uh, uh, from minus 100 to 100 though because we're going to be exclusive of that top limit. And then I'm going to divide it by 100 but a floating value of 100. Now this is a little bit complicated if you're not familiar with um, the way that code does integer maths and floating point maths. If I was just to take, let's say if I just did this and I converted from 0 to 1024 to minus 1 to 1 instead, if I did that all in one step, I would only get the values minus 1, 0 and 1 because these are integer values, they're whole values and when I use the map function on integer values, I will only get integer values out again as well. So I would kind of lost all the precision I would have got from using an analog controller. I'd sort of have turned it into a digital controller. So to retain some of that precision, rather than just converting it directly to a value between minus 1 and 1, I'm going to first convert it into a value between minus 1 and 100, and then I'm going to divide that by 100, but using floating point maths. So that's going to enable me to have a value like minus 0.72 or plus 0.16 or something like that. That's going to be more precision and actually get me a degree of how far I'm pushing the joystick in each direction rather than just all the way to the right, all the way to the top, things like that. So that's a little bit uh, complicated if you're not used to integer maths and floating point maths, but that's the point of doing that. So I've now got uh, my joystick inputs in the range from minus 1 to 1 and I've also got some uh, fractional precision in them as well. So then we need to tell, well, are we actually uh, pressing the joystick at all? Are we giving an input at all? So what I'll say is, well, we'll have a bit of a dead zone in the middle because I don't want it to be really twitchy. So, so long as either the X or the Y input is greater than 0 0.1, so if I'm pushing it more than 10% of the way in any direction from the center, I'll regard that as an input. So we're pressing the joystick in a direction. Then we'll say, okay, how long has it been since we last uh, sent a command to the CNC? Is the time now 
the difference between that and the last time we sent a command is that greater than the repeat delay which we set at the top of the code here. So remember we don't want to spam the controller with too many commands because that will cause it to um, overflow its buffer so we want to just hold these back slightly. If it's been sufficiently long since the last time we sent one okay then we will send the next code. So what we're doing here is we're constructing another command very similar to the commands that we sent up here but this time instead of sending an absolute coordinate value so x21 y7 we're going to send a relative coordinate value to wherever the head is at at the moment. So we'll start off with this $j equals. This means that the following command is going to be this jog command, this idea of a manual override. And then we'll uh, begin by saying g91. So remember up here we were saying g90. That was because the following coordinates were going to be absolute coordinates. Here we're going to send g91 because these are going to be relative or incremental coordinates to wherever the head is at at the moment because we're just going to jog it a little bit from where it is. How far are we going to jog it? Well we're going to jog it in the x axis. We're going to jog it however far we were holding the joystick down multiplied by that delta amount we set at the top there. So if we were holding the joystick all the way to the right axis we would uh, move this amount. If we were only moving the joystick halfway to the right we would send half of this amount. And uh, we're going to do that in the x and the y and when we're going to set the feed rate uh, according to the movement speed we defined at the top and the maximum of whichever one of the uh, x and the y we are inputting. So this basically allows us to have that proportional control over how far we want the head to move based on how far we are moving the joystick. Okay, so we're going to send that and then uh, again slightly differently than we did before. Every time you issue a command to um, the Gerbil controller on the CNC it responds back over the serial connection with a little response that says OK. So here we're using alt serial.print to send the commands to the CNC controller here we're going to use alt serial dot find which is going to read any input that's arriving on the receive pin on our software receive pin and we're going to wait until we find the message OK. Now that doesn't actually mean that the command has been executed, it doesn't mean that it's moved this far yet, it simply means that the controller has received the message and it's added it to its queue of commands to uh, execute. Then we'll update the last command and we'll also update that flag that says uh, that we are currently jogging. Now this section here, um, this gets executed if we are not currently moving the joystick in a direction and if we are not currently moving the joystick in a direction but we were in the last frame that means that we've just released the joystick and when we do that we need to tell the CNC not we just we don't just want to stop sending new messages to it but we actually want to tell it to stop any queued messages it might have as well. So remember I mentioned that the Gerbil controller has this buffer of commands it doesn't actually execute commands immediately as soon as they're sent to it what it does is it allows you to queue a sequence of commands and that's what we did here we sent all these commands one after another we didn't wait for one to be uh, you know, completed before sending the next. We just send them all and we let the controller work its way through them. And that's what we were doing with the jog commands as well. For as long as we were holding the joystick down, we kept on sending new jog commands to tell it to move further and further. But as soon as we let go of the joystick, we don't just want to stop sending commands. We want to make sure it doesn't execute any of the commands that are on its queue as well because we just want it to stop immediately. So that's what we do here. Um, what we've got here is a, a special command. This is called a jog cancel command. Now this is actually a, a non-printable character. So we were using uh, dot print before to send 
these kind of messages that look like this because these are all nice ASCII characters. They're letters and numbers we can send. The jog cancel command is an extended ASCII character, so we can't use print for that. Instead, we'll use write and we'll write this value 0x85. That's going to tell uh, the controller not just to stop the current command but also clear any uh, jog commands that have been sent to it that haven't been executed yet in the queue to forget those as well and we'll also then tell it uh, this is another special command that will tell it to just sort its um, buffer out basically so this queue of commands that it had in advance let's just tidy that up um, and that's what we do when we stop jogging so there we go so we've had the sequence of uh, pre-programmed commands that we've sent from the Arduino here. We've had the manual jog commands that we've created and sent based on a joystick input. And then the final way we can control it is this idea of a pass-through. So when this Arduino has received a command on its serial, on its hardware serial interface, this is one that's going to the PC. So while uh, there is any input available on the serial connection, now watch carefully what we're doing here with the serials and the alt serials. So if there's anything available on the serial connection, we read it, but then we write it to the alt serial connection. So we're reading from the hardware serial, we're writing to the software serial, and then this section here is totally the reverse. If there's anything available to read on the software serial connection, we will read it and write it to the hardware serial connection. So this is this idea of a pass-through. Whenever any information comes from the PC, so if you're running some, um, I'm using something called Laser Gerbil, uh, there's also um, Universal G Code Sender, there's lots of software you can get on GitHub and other places that will allow you to control these devices. They all use the serial interface over the USB and if they send any commands, what we'll do is just take those commands, not change them at all, but pass them on to the controller. And whenever the controller responds with any uh, status update or anything, we'll read it from the controller and write it back to the serial. Now, if you remember, right at the beginning of this, I said at the end of setup, we would write this uh, question mark here, this alt serial.println command which sent a question mark to the controller. And I said it would reply with this here. Well, this bit of code here is the bit that actually uh, receives that response and prints it out to our serial monitor. Because uh, we sent the question mark, the question mark got received, processed, and um, we will read the response and write it back. Also, every time we send one of these messages here, we will get a response back that just says OK. Um, so you can read those uh, responses here just to make sure that every command has been received. Or if it encounters an error at all, it will send an error back and an error code, and this will print that error code to the serial connection. So this will allow us to totally transparently monitor what's going on in the communication between the, uh, the PC and the control software. So there's just a couple of final points I want to mention about this project. And the first of these is about the noise that the stepper motors make. Now, stepper motors, when they rotate, inevitably make a certain noise. And the pitch of that noise actually varies depending on the speed that they're rotating at. As you might have heard in the video earlier, or if you've ever listened to a CNC machine or a laser engraver up close, it can kind of sound as if the machine's singing nearly, um, as the pitch of the frequency of that sort of humming changes. Now, there's no way to avoid that completely, but you can deaden the sound slightly by encasing the motors more better than I did in this example. And you can also kind of mask it somewhat with a sound effect or if you have a background music track playing. And actually that's pretty appropriate anyway because if you're trying to convince players that there's some kind of supernatural force at work, then having uh, some sort of ethereal sound at the same time is pretty appropriate, I'd say. So the second thing I want to talk about is about the strength of the magnets which I'm using. Now, magnetic strength is measured with the letter N and then a number. These are N52 magnets. 
and the higher the number, the stronger the magnet is. But also, larger physical magnets tend to be stronger than smaller physical magnets. So you can get away with using a lower n number magnet if the magnet itself is physically bigger. And to give you an idea of uh, how far they can get through, so I've got a book here which is approximately, I would say, uh, an inch in thickness, give or take. And I've got one magnet on the top there. If I place another magnet on the bottom, you'll see that I can quite easily uh, and reliably move that magnet through an inch of um, thick paper there with no problem at all. Um, so that, I would say, is, is plenty for most applications like this. It obviously also depends on the friction of the surface on the top here. Here I've got a nice smooth surface, so you can see I move around easily. Um, what you might find you want to do on the top is uh, whichever bit isn't magnetic and obviously you might want to hide the magnet better than I did in the example there um, with maybe a bit of felt underneath it or something like that um, that would have the effect of both getting a nice surface which would slide around but also would uh, hide conceal the magnet inside the prop on the top and you'd want some way to ensure that uh, that item whatever it is that you're moving around the surface be it a chess piece or the planchette or whatever else was placed in the right position to start the movement. Uh, so perhaps you have some kind of denoted area where players have to place it, or perhaps you have the mechanism itself out of reach of the players to prevent them from uh, taking that item away from the surface. And only when it is placed at the appropriate start position, lined up with the uh, mechanism underneath, that the pattern starts to play out. Now I think there's loads of ways that you could use this same basic mechanism in an escape room. Not everyone is into Ouija boards, that's fine. I gave the example of the automated chess board that could play itself, for example. But you could also have maybe a pen or a piece of chalk mounted to that moving head and use it to write a message to players instead. And if you do want to use a, a device like this in your escape room, if you do use it, I'd love to know what kind of ideas you come up with as to how to use it. As always, I will put the code download and the fritzing wiring diagrams and everything else, the list of parts I used, over on my Patreon account uh, where you can download it from there. I'm only able to create these tutorial videos with the amazing support of my Patreons, so I want to thank you all ever so much. Um, I've got all my downloads to all of the projects I do on this channel are available over there. So if you are able to, if you'd like to support me to make more in the future, do please um, check it out. Otherwise, I will continue to put these videos up on YouTube anyway, and you can watch them here. Um, in the meantime, I just want to say thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Okay, cheers. Bye.